All right. Uh, thank you. Can you guys hear me all right? Is the mic kind of cool? All right. So um, I am generally a fan of kind of punny, clever titles, but I feel like this one went like right up to the edge. Might have been a bit much. All right. So um, this paper is generally looking at the coping strategies gig workers use to cope with stress and uh, more specifically looking at which coping strategies are most associated with lower stress levels. Uh, to look at this, they did an online survey of about 50 gig workers where they collected demographic and work information along with perceived stress and coping strategy information. And we'll go more de in detail on that uh, later into the presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Method-wise, given the small sample, they were kind of limited. So they're pretty dirt simple. Um, and we'll talk about where they used each of those as we move along. So we will, of course, do the usual summary and evaluation we always do here. But um, this is going to be a little bit non-standard for a couple of reasons. One is this wasn't really published as a full-blown journal article. It was published as a uh, field report. And I didn't get a great description from the journal itself on what they kind of, what criterion they put on that. But um, looking more broadly, it's generally kind of preliminary work, pilot studies, things like that, stuff that doesn't rise to the level of a full-blown journal article. So when, whenever we're doing our assessment of this, kind of keep that in mind and think about what extensions or what you would have changed to have made this maybe get over that bar. Um, and last and second, it's going to be a little non-standard because I got a lot of empathy for these authors. Um, I wrote my dissertation on gig workers, and it's a uniquely challenging population to get at. Um, and so I'm going to use this paper as a bit of a prop near the end to talk about some of the challenges that go along with studying this population. So the background that they offer is that um, non-standard employment relationships, of, to which gig work is, is a part, are associated with increased stress. And certain qualities that are present in gig work are also associated with inc increased stress, things like multiple job holding, unpredictable schedules, and uh, em employee surveillance. Um, weirdly, a lot of research on gig worker stress tends to really fixate on like COVID-19 and the pandemic, which makes a lot of sense because that was a big disruptive thing. A lot of gig workers are involved in like face-to-face -face interactions with people. Uh, but there really aren't any kind of more broad studies of it. Um, and so that's why I still pick this, even though it's very like field reporty. Uh, so to approach the question of stress and coping strategies, they gathered their own data. So they did an online recruitment of Australian gig workers. They targeted 10 online groups, each that had between 500 and 7,000 members. And they also did some recruitment through Twitter posts. And they asked respondents to just do a survey that would take about 10 or 15 minutes online. Now, you know, see these numbers here? They got 68 respondents. Um, so this is kind of a hint as to why it's really challenging to recruit this type of worker. You can't just go to an employer and say, hey, let me talk to your workers because there's a certain legal distance that Uber and a lot of these platforms try to keep from their workers because if they um, start treating them too much like employees, well, then they become employees. And um, that is something Uber very much does not want. So anyway, out of those 68 respondents after exclusion criteria, people less than 18, people who weren't actually gig workers and so on, um, they were left with 49 usable responses. Uh, it was majority male, the most frequent age bracket was 35 to 44, and the majority of respondents reported working for only one employer, because employer is kind of a loaded term in this context. Uh, over on the right-hand side there, you can see a chart that shows the relative frequency of the different work arrangements. The most frequent was temp or short-term work. So that could be somebody who's independently working a temporary job at an employer where they don't have an expectation that that contract will continue. Um, you also added your platform workers. These were all kind of relatively less frequent compared to temp work. Platform workers, this is what I think most people think of whenever they hear the term gig worker people working for Uber, TaskRabbit, Lyft, things like that. 
We also had independent contractors, which is very broad and is not typically included as like a, um, in, uh, by a lot of researchers as being gig worker, but some are. On call workers and uh, text and phone based workers. And what they mean by that in this context is people who receive work assignments via text or phone call. That could be from multiple firms or individuals, or it could be from one consistent firm or individual. And then the last category here is supplemental gig work, where they said, do you do gig work as a supplement to some other form of traditional employment? So I do apologize for this slide, um, but it's super necessary. The first thing you should do whenever you read any paper that says, I'm studying gig workers, is you should find out what the heck they mean by that. Uh, because there's no widely accepted definition, it's really complicated, and everyone does it differently. So I really want you just to focus on the highlighted section here. They asked workers if they had any work arrangements in their life that had the following. You know, no, no long-term contract, working on a temporary basis, on-call, uh, working a variable numbers of hours or tasks each week, and then working for more than one employer. And the paragraph that follows, they give a bunch of examples to kind of prompt them of like, hey, if you work for this one, maybe you're a gig worker. Um, so this is maybe one of the broadest, you know, definitions of gig worker I've seen in any any paper. It's um, it would be more proper to call this a uh, paper on non-standard workers than gig workers specifically. So again, they're kind of saying they're studying one thing, but they're really looking at a completely different population. And we'll talk about that in more detail later. The measures for stress and coping were a little bit more off the shelf. Um, so they used the perceived stress scale of 14, which is just 14 items measure of Likert scale from zero to four with a max score of 56. Um, likewise, they picked kind of an existing inventory for coping. So the brief coping scale, which was I think it's 28 questions across 14 subscales, uh, and they divide those subscales up, like we see at the bottom here, between approach-based coping strategies, avoidant coping strategies, and then other coping strategies um, over on the far side there. Methods, like I said, they're pretty dirt simple. Uh, to look at the relationship between perceived stress and different categorical work characteristics, they just use one-way ANOVAs. Um, relationship between coping strategies and perceived stress measures. This is kind of like the main result from the paper. They just use simple Pearson's correlations. And then for basically every other hypothesis, it was just t-tests. The most commonly reported uh, coping strategies were acceptance, planning, and active coping. Um, and those were all in the uh, approach-based categories. Self-distraction among the avoidant categories was also very common. One thing to remember here is that really small sample size um, and the way they're reporting these is just mean plus or minus standard deviation. 68% of the sample lies in the plus or minus standard deviation range, right? So none of these are significantly different from one another. Um, so that's a giant asterisk next to this this list. To the mainline results, to the mainline results, though, uh, they did find significant relationships between active coping strategies, emotional support, and planning coping strategies, uh, and those were all negatively associated with the perceived stress score. Among avoidance strategies, they found self-distraction, substance abuse to be negatively related to perceived stress score and self-blame to be positively related to perceived stress score. They didn't include the, the avoidance strategies in the table, but they are of similar magnitudes to the correlations of the uh, approach-based coping strategies. And there was no significance found for humor or religion. So from what I gather, they just used the raw uh, PSS 14 score and they just did a simple Pearson's correlation on each sub, uh, subscale score. So they didn't reduce it to categories or dichotomize anything, um, which may not have been the best approach. So uh, a few of their other questions, here's how they turned out. Um, 
The perceived stress scores differed slightly by work arrangement, but not significantly so. They did find significant differences in terms of stress when it came to working hours. So those working 10 or fewer hours had lower stress scores compared to those working 20 or 20 to 30 hours per week. Um, they found similar results for income. So those making less than 20,000 Australian dollars a year had higher stress scores than those in the higher earning brackets that they uh, defined. And those with more years of education also had significantly higher stress scores. And then finally, they, one of their big questions was, uh, does number of employers have an effect? And they didn't find any significance there. So one thing I did wanna talk about here is the discussion section of this paper. So whenever you're writing a lot of sections of papers, it's pretty straightforward. Um, in the method section, you talk about what you did. In your results section, you talk about what you found. That's not easy, but there is kind of a, a cookbook to some of these things. There's a little more art to writing a discussion section, and especially whenever you're faced with really modest results like the authors of this paper have, it's really easy to oversell what you're doing and stick your foot in your mouth, or to undersell what you're doing and just be like, well, none of this mattered anyway. And I think these authors did a very good line of kind of, a very good job of balancing those two concerns. They contextualized what they found in the existing literature, they qualified it appropriately, and given the kind of field report nature of this, they also did a lot of uh, discussion on the challenges they faced and how they or future researchers might approach those challenges in the future. So it's just a, a really good example of a discussion section that was probably pretty challenging to write. So before we go into the you know, normal evaluation and Q&A about the article, I wanna dig into some of these issues that's are, that are associated with studying gig workers. Gig work is really complicated and ill-defined. Um, I pulled this diagram from a different paper I like that really does a good job of conceptualizing all of these things. Working from the outside in, we've got all workers of which non-traditional workers are a subset of which you know gig workers are a subset. But we've got things like contingent workers who are both gig workers and not gig workers. We've got self-employed, similar boat. And whenever you've got all these kind of complicated overlapping categories, it can be very difficult to write survey questions that accurately elicit what you're trying to elicit. Um, so for example here, a musician who is um, self-employed is probably a gig worker, right? But some self-employed person who runs, say, a small construction company, we wouldn't think of them as a gig worker, but they're both self-employed. And so because of this, it's uh, a lot of gig work papers really suffer from an ill-defined population. And uh, because of that, you get a lot of conflicting results in the literature. So one paper finds, you know, pot, you know, gig workers are doing great, but whenever you dig into it, they're studying a different population than the paper that says gig, gig workers are doing terribly. So important thing to keep in mind. And that makes, as I said, the survey questions really difficult. So for most people with a single traditional job, labor market questions can be straightforward. Who's your employer? What is your occupation? Were you unemployed in the last month? Pretty clear answers for most people to have a normal job. But gig work is really a lot of time intermittent. They may only do it for days or weeks at a time. And it's often pursued a long traditional employment. So if you ask a gig worker, hey, what's your occupation? And they put a lot of hours into gig work, they're probably still gonna say their normal occupation if it, or their traditional occupation if it is pursued alongside their gig work. So let's imagine a respondent that you know, works construction spring through fall, but gets laid off in the winter and just drives Uber a few weeks in the winter to kind of deal with un, unexpected expenses. If you ask them, hey, are you a gig worker right now? and it's July, they're gonna say no. But if it's December, they're gonna say yes. And if we introduce a recall window, right? We say, hey, have you done gig work in the past month, six months, year? Their response is gonna be highly sensitive to the recall window we choose. So um, I've, I've read a lot of um, papers on gig work that just are trying to determine the scale of participation. And the estimates range from 2% to 22% of the labor force. And it is really sensitive to their definition and their recall window. 
Um, in this regard, this paper did some things right. It included a lot of categories. Unfortunately, those were overlapping categories, which isn't ideal. Uh, they provided examples of those categories, and we know that that works to uh, help elicit more accurate responses given the kind of established best practices. And using the recall window of are you currently doing gig work was also probably the right choice because they're trying to study the stress associated with being exposed to this set of labor relations. And so if somebody did it six months ago, probably not the right recall window. Uh, but their strict criteria for, you know, you, are you doing gig work right now probably contributed in some sense to their small sample size. Uh, and given their definitions, they also captured a lot of people that we wouldn't traditionally think of as gig workers. Um, and so there, there are other ways to do this than to do your own survey, right? There's existing sources of government data. And that's what I ended up using for my dissertation. But part of the problem with most sources of government data is they're really a, they were the institutions that collect and distribute that data were constructed in the post-war period to deal with a traditional labor market. So they don't really ask a lot of questions to let you get at the gig work issue. And so what a lot of researchers have done is they've gone directly to platforms because platforms are already serving digital information to a bunch of people. They're um, able to introduce surveys into that or they're able to use administrative data that the platform is already gathering. But platforms are really, really precious with that information. Um, and they don't like giving it out to researchers in part because that information about both customers and their workers give them competitive advantage in the marketplace. Um, so that is a difficult road to go down. All right, so returning to the typical format, um, I think that this paper uh, asked some questions that other papers weren't asking. And they did so in a systematic way using widely used assessments for stress and coping mechanisms. Uh, they did have a lot of issues with recruitment. It's ultimately only cross-sectional and descriptive. There's nothing causal here. Uh, and they didn't even have like a comparison group that would help like bolster that. So um, I've got a few questions prepared, but before that, any questions or comments? Yeah for picking an interesting paper you know not all of them are so interesting but they're all vital but i had uh actually sort of two questions the one was were, were virtual gigs included like some studio needs needs uh video editing and they call you to do it remotely versus you know uber was that included yeah, I think so. Like going back to their questionnaire. Okay, I sorry, I might have missed. Oh that. no, it's all good. Um, but yeah, so I think that if they were working for more than one employer, they'd be in there. If it's kind of as needed work, where you're being like called up for contract work, I think that that person would be um, included in there. What? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. If gigging is different than hands-on gigging, you know, just your your thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, they are different, and there are also different populations doing it. Uh, but one thing that um, you know isn't in this, but in my own work, is um, in-person gig work. Uh, at least in kind of the earlier period, where most of that was like ride sharing, yeah. was very man skewed, and not in-person gig work was a little more female skewed. Okay, um, and that changed a lot whenever you started getting more and more of these like grocery delivery yeah. uh, services, and then those services are very female skewed. Okay, so uh, the population it, it's very flat. It's in flux, I, I guess, right yeah. now. Okay, thank you. My second question, really, and you hit upon it with COVID. Uh, when was this? Uh, the first part of that is when was this collected? When were were these data collected? So I think this was collected. So this paper came out in 2023, 20, and I think they collected it in early 23 or late 2023. I don't know that for certain, though. I was just curious because during COVID, I, like many other people, ended up doing some things we wouldn't normally do. And I took up Australian uh, rugby league watching that. Um, and I noticed that their COVID response was completely different than America's. When we were locked down, they had full stadiums. Mm -hmm. When we were let out, 
their stadiums were empty and they even had camps and arrests of people. So I wanted to know, you know, they didn't have, they were unable to, to measure the stress in Australian society. Yeah. But I was just wondering what your thoughts were on COVID and the Australian response and how we may see from our perspective and maybe see, see things differently. Yeah. I, I'm not sure because honestly, I don't know that much context on like the Australian COVID response. Um, I know in the US context, kind of uh, doing the comments thing here, appealing to reveal preferences, right? Whenever COVID kicked off, you had a lot of people who really opted into the online tasks, the virtual stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Stuff where you're not face to face with someone who can spew droplets in your face. Um, and away from a lot of the other uh, gig work that was more in person. But once the expanded unemployment insurance benefits expired, well, that was a different story. So basically, um, when people are given an alternative to this kind of work, they tend to opt out of it. Um, and so it, it's, I think that the, the central thing that I can speak to is more like the platform by platform differences than like international differences. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I guess a question for you, but also for everybody, what what alternative methodologies are there that would would get us a better picture of the gig worker experience? <clears throat> and that's the, I opening it to everybody because it's not just you who could answer this kind of question mm -hmm. because it's not specific to study. What was the question again? Question is, what are some alternative methodologies? Because sounds like based a survey. Sounds okay. like surveys are pretty common, even with the with the uh, you know large data sets that the, the government tends to collect or are, are survey based, whether it be calling somebody up on the phone and asking questions or they fill it out. What yeah. you know, they're still what survey are based. Yeah. What are some alternatives that would allow us to get a, a maybe a more clear picture? of the gig worker experience, you know, whether it be one one platform or another, I don't know. Like direct interviews? Yeah, I mean, direct interviews, you know, qualitative data type yeah, of approach. I feel like the low sample size of this type of workers is because they're just not responding to surveys or not answering phones or not participating. So direct interviews would be more labor intensive and resource intensive, but like Absolutely. it would give you, would answer all that, you would give full data for every person that you interview, it just would take a lot of resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think I would almost rather see a paper, a qualitative paper that does interviews with a thousand gig workers than, you know, a very lackluster quality. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think the case, I think the study would have benefited as well from a little bit more specificity. Like if they would have just focused in on Uber workers or just focused in on one particular one and been able to really study or partner with that organization in order to get a lot more specific information, I think. Because I think specificity is, is is the biggest problem that this has. It's just really hard to pin anything down because it was just so skewed on all the data. Yeah, that's and what it, it felt like. And like this is kind of a problem in the literature as a whole. Was just like it's very poorly defined. You know, poor definitions, right? Like the, nobody spends time kind of clearing up the conceptual issues before they just dive into like let's ask people questions. It seems. I was struck <laughs> by how you told talked about how hard it was to do this. I was also struck by the fact that you have Facebook pages with 7,000 people and they got 49, mm -hmm. which made me wonder, well, who's actually taking the time to respond to this? What's the selection bias that's going on? Who are these people? They got the others with the avoidant things and alcoholism go up. I was wondering, you know, who, who are, I mean, it's build work, as you said, but it's so small that standard deviations were so large. It kind of made me wonder what we gathered yeah and i mean one, one might even think that engagement with social media is an avoidant coping strategy right so um yeah it, it's difficult to say but there's definitely non-random sampling you can't these researchers could make no claim as to representativeness of the overall population of gig workers and that's a major shortcoming um so i i was just thinking about this um to your question of what are some other methodologies to, to get at this. Something that uh, some researchers have done is uh, digital ethnography. So I, I don't know if ethnography is something that kind of comes up in this world, um, but basically engaging with online communities for long periods of time and following people. Um, 
and oftentimes doing interviews with people who you've observed on those platform or on those um, platforms. So that's another methodological way that, that people can get at this in a more qualitative way. So uh, I got a couple of minutes here and um, we were talking about kind of engagement with platforms to get their data and, and have them as uh, collaborators on projects like this. There's a really famous example from the economics literature uh, where really big deal economist, Alan Kruger, he was in the Obama administration. If he hadn't passed away, he probably would have gotten the 2021 Nobel Prize, like big deal. He wrote a paper with the chief economist at Uber on the uh, economic conditions of Uber workers and their satisfaction with the work and things like that. And it, it's a, uh, you know, it paints a very things are hunky dory picture. And this was cited in policy debates for years and years and years. And because it's got a prominent economist was published in a good journal, it made the rounds. Um, and a lot of the subsequent research really stood in contrast to it. It, it helped found different results, um, particularly when studying other platforms. And then it came out uh, just, I think, last year that uh, Alan Kruger was paid $100,000 to write the thing. So, so uh, yeah, of course, everything's hunky-dory. But uh, so one of the things to, to always realize whenever we're talking gig, uh, gig research is there's an immense immense amount of money at stake. The platforms are self-interested and they advocate for themselves and they're willing to use academics to do it. Um, so it's, uh, and even the, the kind of luminaries of the profession aren't, aren't immune to that. Uh, anyway, that's all I got. Thanks. Okay, can everybody hear me? Cool. All right, everybody get some more tacos. Um, well, hello everybody. My name is Andrew Ganell. I'm a PhD candidate uh, with Dr. Tommaso Lenzi in the HGN lab for bionic engineering. And I'm involved with the ergonomics and safety program here. And I'm excited to be presenting a paper that I found on flexible sensor-based biomechanical evaluations of lower back exoskeleton use in lifting. So kind of the overarching problem uh, with this paper is how can we help people that have or get work-related 
musculoskeletal disorders. So during lifting tasks, um, people might uh, be lifting something that's extremely heavy in warehouses. And we see that about 40% of disorders are related to the lower back and about 25% of these um, total worker compensation costs uh, in the United States, which is a, a big problem and puts them out of work for a long period of time. So how can we help with these types of disorders? Uh, something that may or may not help is some uh, exoskeletons in the field of um, like uh, mechanical engineering. We see passive exoskeletons and powered exoskeletons. And on the right here in this paper, they use a passive exoskeleton that's basically working as a spring joint uh, at the hip. So basically how it works is when they're wearing it around their pelvis, when they go down uh, to lift something up, they're going to be compressing the springs and loading it up. And then when they go to lift, it'll give them that power and that energy release that they need uh, when they go to lift the box. And a lot of these wearable devices are intended uh, to really augment and enable um, human physical capabilities in the workplace and hopefully prevent uh, these injuries from happening in the first place. Uh, let's see what else. Um, hopefully these lower back exoskeletons are designed well enough uh, to reduce a lot of that biomechanical loading that they get in their lower spine area. Um, and that's what uh, this paper will go into investigating during lifting tasks. Does anybody have any questions about this device uh, before I move on? Okay. So the next question is, how do we validate these devices on people to see if they're working properly? And that kind of goes down to motion capture. So optical motion capture is great. It has been seen to be very accurate uh, in looking into kinematics of joint positions in space during walking or lifting tasks. And it's also uh, very useful with uh, use of force plates, uh, which you can see this archer is standing on. And through the power of force plates, we can uh, back calculate what each joint is producing as far as the torque in the joint all the way up um, to the back to see how much uh, stress might be on the back during certain tasks. But optical motion capture does have its drawbacks. Uh, motion capture requires a laboratory setting. So you need to have lots of expensive cameras and force plates. And it requires tight fitting clothes so the markers can be visible by all these cameras that are around the person. So that can be a problem during lifting tasks, especially in the pelvis area. All of these markers are gonna go missing at some point. And at that point, you have to make up that data in order to uh, really see what's happening at critical points during lifting. Other motion capture devices uh, that have been used with exoskeletons are inertial measurement sensors. And um, these basically have accelerometers and gyroscopes inside of each sensor that you could place on each segment. And basically with these, it will read in six degrees of freedom of translation and rotations of each segment. Uh, unlike optical motion capture, these devices can be worn on the outside of, the, of your any day clothes, um, but also have drawbacks such as being quite bulky on the hands or around your thighs um, or waist and in some cases have wires that would be pulling, which could inhibit your actual motion when you're going to pick something up um, because of the wires tugging on your arms and your body. So this gets to uh, the actual sensors that were used in this study. Uh, BioStamp 
multi-mode sensors. Their flexible design is very unique in that it goes directly onto their skin and will conform uh, to their body's movements. And just like a inertial measurement sensor, they also have accelerometers, gyroscopes, and additionally, they have biopotential measurements to read muscle activation. So this is um, something that could be used to see what your muscles are producing during certain tasks. And I'll kind of go into it, into this, into the methods. Um, but each sensor can only produce either kinematic data or biopotential measurement. It can't do both at the same time. So they, they end up having a lot of these sensors on the body. So going into the main goals of this paper, number one, they wanted to validate this flexible sensor-based system, uh, their kinematics and dynamics during lifting against a reference of optical motion capture system that's been used widely in the past. And number two, after they've uh, validated uh, that flexible sensor system, they want to demonstrate the utility of it by evaluating it during lifting tasks with and without that low back exoskeleton that I showed you earlier. So now getting into the methods of the paper, uh, 12 healthy subjects were recruited for this study, six male, six female. And as I said earlier, they used 11 sensors, uh, four EMGs. So let me make sure I get this right. They put four on the lower back muscles of the thoracic erector spinae and the lumbar erector spinae. And I can show you that picture again. So marked in red, uh, they have two on each side of the spine for both of those regions. And then they also put uh, seven uh, kinematic centers on the sternum. Uh, the lower back, they had two of them uh, to read the flexion and extension angles of the lower back um, between L5 and S1. And then they had um, one on each thigh and shank. And they uh, did this against a reference. They used 12 uh, Vicon camera system uh, with two force plates. As you can see on the screen, they had like a symmetric um, foot placement and the box was placed in the same spot each time. And they would perform this squat lifting task five times with and without the exoskeleton. And after they would pick up this six kilogram box, it would be followed with five to 10 seconds of just static standing. And due, due to the limitations of uh, Vicon or optical motion sensors, uh, the marker system, they did not use um, the optical senses, uh, sensors for the exoskeleton task because it'd be hard to place each marker in the correct spot with the exoskeleton on. So going into the results of goal number one, which was a uh, sensor-derived system versus marker-derived system, uh, they had the RSE, a root mean squared error, terms for each uh, kinematic lumbar flexion, hip flexion, knee flexion, ankle flexion. And as you can see, RMSE values uh, all lower or almost lower than five degrees, which was considered uh, great according to a source that they uh, had in the paper. And uh, they also had a R correlation coefficient uh, greater than 0.9, which is um, a really great uh, result that they saw. And uh, in this figure, uh, number four here, this was just taken from one subject. Um, so this was their average uh, kinematics across five uh, sit or five um, lifting tasks. And as you can see, they track really uh, closely the sensor derived and marker derived basically overlap each other, uh, which is great uh, for their first goal. And if I were to add one thing about the flexion moment 
uh, between L5 and S1, it could be because uh, there's some sort of error between losing those markers as they're going down. So their algorithms uh, might change slightly um, between the sensor derived and marker derived systems. Does anybody have any questions about the results from goal one before I move forward? Okay, I'll move on. And now to goal number two, which is with the with and without the exoskeleton, and this was only using the uh, flexible sensors. So there's no um, marker-based system in these results. And um, at the top, we can see the peak uh, joint angles in kinematics and the flexion moments, um, peak values across all subjects. And it was shown to have significantly different peak values in lumbar flexion and hip flexion, which might make sense if you can think about um, you're wearing the exoskeleton and when you go down, you're, it's compressing. So your hip flexion might decrease because it's pushing back on you. So that could be the reason uh, for this decrease in hip flexion with the exoskeleton. And because of that, your lumbar flexion would have to increase in your back. So that's an uh, interesting result that the sensor-based system was able to detect uh, the changes between kinematics um, between with and without the exoskeleton. And another good sign is that the knee flexion and ankle flexion uh, kinematics really don't sh uh, show any differences at all because the exoskeleton doesn't or shouldn't affect those joints. It doesn't cross the knee. It doesn't cross the ankle. It only crosses the hip. And lastly, oh. A question from online. Okay. Chapman is, is wondering, is there a literature that has discussed the acceptable differences in tests? Between like marker base and other like accelerometer based systems? I, I believe that's what he's getting at. Chapman, is that what you're getting at? Yeah. I, I'm for sure there is. Um, yeah, you can kind of look through this paper and see what kind of citations they have uh, during their discussion. Um, and I'm sure there's uh, plenty more, um, even probably with more subjects that have um, ran tests between maybe different inertial measurement units against each other or different optical motion capture systems against each other. So I would say yes. Is there any other questions? Okay, back to my uh, last result um, relating to the flexion moment between L5 and S1. We saw a decrease um, from without exoskeleton to with. So there's potential now that uh, because of the exoskeleton there, um, lower back torque is now decreasing. So hopefully that load that they're experiencing on their lower back is also decreasing. So you can also see uh, the effect from the EMG values too. Uh, the difference between without the exoskeleton to with showed a, about a 16% difference and a 13% difference in their lumbar and thoracic uh, erector spinae muscles. So, now kind of going into some of the limitations of this study. Um, the biostamp sensors are not capable of requiring um, motion in multiple planes. This study only looked into uh, the sagittal plane. So whatever these uh, joint positions are or moments in this plane. And the placement strategy had to be specifically designed um, for this study in lifting. So they had to place these sensors strategically to get those correct like lumbar um, lower limb dynamics to evaluate the device. And lastly, uh, this wasn't performed on workers in a workplace because 
there's no force plates in a warehouse. So hopefully that's something we can go towards and uh, figure out a way to maybe um, calculate some sort of dynamic motion on actual workers rather than just recruited uh, subjects in a lab. And just to conclude on those two goals, uh, they were able to demonstrate that those flexible sensors uh, had comparable um, kinematics and dynamics to the motion capture based system uh, with markers. And uh, the sensors were also able to recognize the effects of that lower back exoskeleton um, in their kinematics and uh, lower back moment with their EMGs included as well. So now I'd like to move on to a group discussion. Maybe I can just um, ask everybody if they have any questions about this before we move in to the discussion. That, yes. With the exoskeleton, you said there was the changes, the knee flexion and the lumbar back. Is that what they were intending for the exoskeleton to make it so the flexion would decrease on the hips and not, and then increase on the lumbar section? Or do you know what their intention was with that? I think that their intention was to reduce the peak torque on the lower back that they would get through inverse dynamics and calculating um, what kind of stress their lower back is undergoing between those two joints um, in the spine. And I think that just by doing that task, um, it just so happened that all those subjects saw reduction in hip flexion because of the exoskeleton. So they had to maybe overcompensate in their back to flex more. Increase the strain on the back because you hold the lift with your legs, not your back, or is yeah, that going to help with the, the way back strain? The way I was kind of thinking about it was towards the beginning, you see an increase. Um, because the the whole movement time and percentage was like from this point here to them standing up. So at the beginning, they probably have to uh, flex their back more because of the exoskeleton. And towards the middle, they weren't flexing their hips as much. So that could be due to the compression in the springs. Um, and there was... A little bit, yeah, there is this peak uh, lumbar flexion here. Um, but due to the uh, release and energy from the exoskeleton, that's probably how it makes up for this uh, flexion moment and the reduction in muscle effort. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the this specific type of like exoskeleton device are the effects on these typical effects on these measurements well known already because it seems like the main focus of the authors is on the measurement devices not mm -hmm. the assistive device mm -hmm. yeah i think the like, like the main um idea from this study was to see if they can use like a flexible sensor in industry and put that on workers um, and they just wanted to see if those sensors were able to like see um, how the exoskeleton affects a certain movement. So they could really have done, I guess, any like certain task. And because this exoskeleton helps in lifting, that's the one they chose. But they really just wanted to validate the sensors. Yeah. Yes. Did they uh, specifically say in the method section if they did like there are five lifts with the exoskeleton first and then they did it without the exoskeleton or like temporality wise like which was first and then do you think yeah. there was like fatigue that could have been at play for that so in their methods they did say that they randomized the sequence the sequence of each condition was randomly assigned to each subject so six would perform lifting first with the exoskeleton and then vice versa. I don't know about fatigue though. They didn't really go into that too much. I I, th I would think that doing five lifting tasks wouldn't be too 
bad. I mean, it depends on your population, but they were all healthy subjects. So, yes. But as I said at the beginning, you said in this study they were using passive exoskeletons. What's the difference between a passive and an active? So, so passive exoskeleton, um, in this case, is using a spring. And I said earlier, uh, there's also powered exoskeletons, uh, which is something that we're investigating in our lab um, that use motors and batteries um, to actually apply assistive torque to some of these joints rather than rely on some spring mechanism. Mm -hmm. I can go to the discussion section next. I think we have a couple more minutes here. So I'll kind of ask um, the room here, how could this study potentially push forward the field of ergonomics and safety in industry in the workplace? I mean, it seems that those sensors would be a lot easier to do than having to bring everybody into the lab and have force plates. If this correlates, uh, you made that easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Right. Get a lot better results and a lot more specific results if you can actually look at what they are actually doing in the field. So mm -hmm. getting them out into the warehouse, letting them make something real, move in the real way that they do it. There's just a huge difference between a controlled laboratory setting. So it could be really helpful with these sensors that actually capture more or right. more accurately. Yes. Yeah. And if they're, you know, really confident in the data that they're getting from those sensors, it seems like they can either show why this product you know, they're, they're targeting a really, really huge swath of workers' comp claims, right? Like those kind of work-related work musculoskeletal um, claims. And so showing that the, the data is strong um, might help say like, well, this is why this works, so we should make more of them, or this is why it doesn't work and help, you know, push kind of an important field in the right direction. Right, yes. Because I kind of struggle to see the point of this paper because there exist systems like that you can buy off the shelf like Xsense. I mean, they are relatively expensive, but much less expensive than a whole paper. Um, and then you can buy EMG sensors from like Delsys that would kind of do the same thing. So I don't know if you can talk about like, yeah, so yeah, like we have Xsense in our lab and basically you put around these straps around your pelvis, you put around your thighs, and that'll help measure your hip flexion. Um, and it is very accurate. And it's like, well, why don't you just put that on the workers? But it's a potential those straps could fall off. It, there's a potential that it could affect how they stand up or how they would lift like a certain object. Um, and that's kind of what the paper was going towards, at least. Um, for me, well, they, they didn't even really check against XNs versus this flexible sensor system, which is also something that I'd be interested in seeing. But I think as far as the flexible sensors, it could be better if you're gonna have these workers wear it throughout their whole shift of like eight hours. Um, it, like we've seen in our lab, if you're walking for six minutes, it's possible that strap could just fall right off your leg. So maybe with those flexible sensors, um, uh, close to your skin with the sticker, it could be a lot better. Yes. If the information they're collecting is held on the sensor, because if it was, that could be very nice because you wouldn't need, you could Xsense, you would need another system there to actually capture the data. Mm -hmm. But if the data was stored on these sensors, then it could be super beneficial because. Yeah, that's a great question. Really question. I don't know. I would assume that they had like a computer. Um, that they had to store all the data on. Um, right. But if if these sensors had the capability of you take them off after in the end of your shift and you just plug it into the computer, you collect all that data, several frames worth of movement, um, you could then uh, transform it into, okay, this is where they had like lifting tasks where they lifted 50 boxes into some truck or something like that and use that for uh, your analysis. But that's a good question, I don't know. <laughs>
Yes. So I'm curious to know if that um, sort of mechanical exoskeleton that you said has kind of the spring load where mm -hmm. they bend down to pick up the box and the spring kind of helps, um, you know, force their bodies back up. I, you mentioned that. Does that require any downward force from the person? Like, does it require them to use That's a great question. Their, like muscles to actually bend down because of the resistance of the spring? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be curious to see what their abdominal muscles look like during that task. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, they're, if they have to compress those springs, how hard is it for them to do that? So, yeah, great point. Yeah, I guess the last thing um, I would want to bring up is uh, they went into like other potential uh, sensors that they could use um, for industrial workers by putting force sensors in their shoes to kind of gauge a dynamic uh, motion um, and get force feedback through that. But I don't know how accurate that would be. A lot of systems are using AI and machine learning to actually predict what their forces might be during certain tasks. So that might be uh, the right pathway going forward in industrial work. Any more questions? Well, thank you, everybody. Well, the same time, same question next week. <laughs> <laughs>